HR Research presents our 2014 webinar series, delivering you the latest in HR news, legislative updates, and industry trends. As a provider of leading talent screening, management, and assessment solutions, we are here to ensure your company's continued success. Global HR Research. We redefine your HR expectations. Hello everyone, my name is Megan Schanfelter and I'm the Manager of Communications and Events here at Global HR Research, a leading provider in talent screening, talent assessment, and talent acquisition solutions. For the past four years, Global HR Research has been ranked as one of the top providers of background screening, drug testing, and pre-hire assessment solutions by HRO Today Magazine. I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today in our webinar entitled The 411 on Background Screening. Today's webinar will be presented by Christine Peacock, Director of Strategic Relations with Global HR Research. This will be a silent webinar. If you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the questionnaire box and we'll respond throughout the presentation. The entire contents of this presentation will be available on our website, www.ghrr.com, 48 to 72 hours after the completion of the webinar. Also, after today's webinar, you will receive a follow-up survey where you'll be able to ask additional questions, make comments, or inquire about GHRR solutions. At this time, I'd like to thank Christine for being here today and turn it over to her. All right. Thanks, Megan. Okay, guys. Like Megan said earlier, it is a silent webinar, so if you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to type them into the questionnaire box and we will answer them as promptly as possible. I do want to make sure that everyone can see my screen and hear me clearly, if you can. There's a little um, button on the screen that looks like a little hand. If you'll raise your hand, let me know that I'm coming through loud and clear. And you can see our screen with the 411 on background screening. Fantastic. All right. Thank you guys for, uh, for helping me out there. So we've got an hour today. And like normal, when I do webinars, we're going to kind of have a lot of jam-packed information uh, within this time frame. I do want to leave some time with question and answers every time I do a webinar specifically about um, background screening and kind of the regulation, um, the changes in the industry. There tends to be a lot of questions, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to leave as much time at the end as possible for it. So let's get started. First and foremost, uh, the content in this webinar is for educational purposes only. Please do not deem this as legal advice or counsel. Um, obviously, I'm here to answer any questions that you may have, um, but if it comes to something very specific about your organization, I will or I may ask you to go back to your legal counsel or internal counsel uh, for further advice. Okay. So just a little bit about myself. Um, again, I'm Christine Peacock. I am the Director of Strategic Relations here at Global. I have roughly about six years industry experience uh, in the background screening drug testing space. My, I guess, roles typically with the organization, um, I do a lot of education internally of our um, staff members here. I also do consultation um, with our current and prospective clients on best practices, how to streamline a lot of this business. Um, I used to be Christine Wynn, those of you that are probably recognizing my voice or my name, um, and I do have a tendency to speak very quickly, uh, specifically during these webinars. So if you have any questions, please feel free um, to type them into the questionnaire box, and then Megan, of course, will interrupt me and, and give me some questions. All right, so we're going to go over really three basic things today, but it's a lot of information into a very small segment. I first want to go over regulation when it comes in terms of your background screening vendor or a CRA, and then, of course, um, regulation on you as the employer and what you should expect um, from both parties, a nature of a database criminal search. This has been actually um, one of the more popular items in the news lately um, when it comes to regulation. Hey, Megan, will you do me a favor? Would you just meet you, yourself real quick? Thank you. Um, database checks have been kind of uh, more frequent in the news, so I just want to make sure that I go over it. Why is it in the news? Why is it one of those things that, as you guys are kind of reevaluating or possibly re evaluating your background screening processes, why is this a huge uh, topic? Um, then I want to give you some recommendations on your best practice when it comes to criminal packages. Ultimately, those of you that are on the line may be in different industries, and you may add items to it, remove items from it, um, but we'll start with kind of the foundation of what the industry would say would be a best practice, and then how do you, at that point, move forward depending on your industries and, of course, your specific need. 
So let's first talk about regulation um, and who's who. I'm sure everyone on the line today is familiar with who the EEOC is, right? The EEOC is there to um, regulate and protect employers and employees. And then traditionally, it's been the Federal Trade Commission, so the FTC. Um, about a year ago, they implemented a new program or I guess um, division called the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. This bureau now oversees consumer reporting agencies, those be your background screening vendors, the consumer, so this is your candidate and or employee, um, and resellers. So here's, here's, here's the difference, right? I have two governing bodies or bodies of government overseeing essentially a hiring or onboarding process, um, some of which you rely on an external vendor like a global HR research or whoever it may be to provide you data so you can make the right um, decisions on eligibility. So if we really look at this, there's a shade of gray, right? I've got the EEOC on one side, I have the CFPB on the other, and there's this kind of overlapping um, process. So I think what makes a good vendor, and, a, and, and I'll call it a partner, right? Um, some of you that are on the line are global HR research clients, some of you on the line are not. Um, I'm not saying not everybody's like this. I think what makes a good partner and a good relationship when it comes to your background screening, specifically with a lot of the litigation that's occurred recently about it, is to go, okay, how are we gonna work together to make sure this little gray area, this middle part where you're providing me data and I've gotta use that data um, for eligibility, I'm not going to show any um, dis you know, discrimination um, based on what you provide to me. I hope that makes sense. Again, if you guys have questions, type them into the questionnaire box. So let's just start with the basics. Some of this is gonna be very repetitive to you, specifically those of you that have been in my webinars before. Um, but according to Wikipedia, what is the FCRA? I'm not gonna read this to you, I'm gonna give you a summary. Essentially, it's a federal guideline and law um, about background screening, about technically credit reporting. It was written in the 1970s, right? Um, so it was really written for credit history. So there's a lot of what I'll call gray areas or areas up for interpretation, right? So the problem with that is because it's not very black and white in some things, in, in some things it is very black and white, in others it's a little gray. Um, I think the difference is you've had so many background screening vendors that are out there providing a service that they're interpreting it one way. Um, another vendor or background screening partner or whatever it may be is interpreting it another. And then you guys as the consumer, the employer, you're confused, right? You know, what am I getting out of you versus, you know, company A versus company B? It's supposed to be the same, right? It's a federal law. So let's also define what a consumer reporting agency. This is anybody that is essentially compiling information for you for a background check. This could be criminal. This could be um, employment verifications, education verifications, references. That's what this is. So it needs to I guess for me, I want to make sure everybody understands a CRA is anybody providing those services. So basically collecting the information, compiling it, and you're paying for that service. So again, I kind of already said this, the text really isn't black and white um, on everything, and specifically when it comes to criminal background checks. So there's two sections, a part of the FCRA. One is section 607, and it specifically talks about the accuracy of reports. It says, okay, whenever a CRA is providing or preparing a consumer report to provide to you guys as the employers or a consumer to make a, um, I'm sorry, you guys are the end user, the consumer is the candidate, to make a decision, we have to follow reasonable procedures to assure maximum possible accuracy, right? This will come key. Trust me, you're gonna hear me say this a lot today. That's why it's highlighted. And then section 613 says, we also have to maintain strict procedures that, that make sure that you get complete and up-to-date records, okay? So again, a lot of things in the FCRA are very black and white, some are gray. This specifically is the gray area that I think um, causes the most confusion when you're looking at your criminal background checks. Earlier today, for example, um, one of our sales reps said, you know, I had a great conversation with um, a newer company, they had just started the business, and their questions were, well, if I'm running this, then why do I need to run this? You know, if I'm doing this, then why do I need to do that? And it really has to boil down to do these two factors. 
essentially you as the end user, the person paying for the service, you will decide what you're going to do or want, right? The difference is, is how is that data delivered to you so that um, both you and your vendor are compliant with both sections, all right? There have been a lot of violations um, in the last couple of years on just consumer reporting agencies. You're talking millions of dollars um, paid because of violations of 607, 613. Um, other violations would include pre-adverse and adverse action letters. There's a lot of things here, and I think what it is is because there are a lot of gray areas, they know that. They know it. And, but it's who's been regulating this industry for a long time. So just in the ones listed here, guys, you're talking over 20 million, $25 million spent on just violations in general, okay? And this is literally just a scratch of the violation um, litigation that has occurred. So that's who regulates the background screening firm, right? So the CFPB, uh, uh, the FCRA, the Fair, uh, Fair Credit Reporting Act, and then of course now the EEOC. Again, I'm not going to read this to you. We all know what the EEOC is, right? They regulate and protect you as the employer employees to make sure that there is no form of discrimination during your employment processes or employment eligibility. So, and I'll kind of get to this next, but you're going to see, I'm going to talk about some of the litigation that has occurred with the EEOC. And really what it boils down to, the EEOC under every single civil action lawsuit that they have um, brought against an employer, and I'm not talking the largest employers out there, I'm talking about some of them are small to medium size, some of them are larger, but the majority of them are small to medium size organizations. They know you may not have everything together yet, so they know it's an easy picking, at least that's the way I'm gonna see it. The verbiage they use is, well, the use of arrest and conviction records to deny employment can be illegal under Title VII. Um, because, it's, you know, is it relevant to the job? It can limit employment opportunities. And they go on more, which I'll get into my uh, next slide, about how this is discriminating against certain populations um, of individuals. So what happened was the EEOC said, okay, fine. Everyone's complaining that we're bringing up these civil action lawsuits and there's no real guideline or rules on how to use criminal arrest records. So April 25th of 2012, they released um, their new guidelines. Before the guidelines, though, they had a program, or they still have a program, called E-Race. Um, it's eradicating racism and colorism in the workplace. And what they did was they said, okay, we're going to start identifying issues and criteria as a part of the pre-hire process and other selection or testing methods that could contribute to discrimination. Okay? They said, well, there's lots of potential for uh, desperate impact. Their argument is that people of certain races um, are arrested or convicted more frequently than others. So how are you looking at this criminal history to not have a desperate impact, right? And of course they, they say, you know, they also have national data that supports um, this argument. So in their new guidelines, and it's really, really long, this is obviously just a summary, but they ultimately say no bright line rules, meaning you can no longer say, well, if you have a felony, I'm not gonna hire you that just no longer works, um, at least in the guidelines of the EEOC. The way they look at it is you have to have a three-factor test. What is the nature and gravity of the test or the offense, right? Um, time since the conviction or the completion of the sentence. For example, if I committed and was convicted of a crime when I was the age of 18, I'm now 45 and I've never had anything in between. You know, I've been great since then. I've learned my lesson. You know, even if it was a felony, um, you have to take that in consideration, right? And of course, the nature of the job held or sought. So if um, it was a nonviolent crime, or let's not, let's not even use that. Let's say um, it was um, embezzlement or whatever it may be. It was uh, money laundering. Well, am I dealing with any cash now today? Or am I you know, going to be a janitor cleaning floors? Um, there's a difference here. So what's the nature of the offense in relation to the job? The other part of this is they said, well, no matter what you get back from your background screening firm, you must do an individualized assessment of the data that's provided. Okay, I will have a slide on this, I promise. Um, it'll be next. I will go into depth on that. And I do wanna talk to you guys about some of um, the things that have been brought up into litigation like adjudication matrix and how this is being um, used against, unfortunately, employers. And then of course, criminal history questions. Those of you um, in some of the states that do have ban the box, 
you're already accustomed to this, but the EEOC is recommending that um, the criminal history question kind of be taken off of the application as it's not something that you want to utilize when you're initially looking at the application um, to review whether or not that person is eligible for the position or not. And then of course, um, looking at at that point, what is the information that's being provided to you from the background screening provider, okay? So let's talk about this individualized assessment. Again, according to the EEOC, though it's not required to do this, employers will need to evaluate um, if there are any criminal offenses that have, you know, um, I guess, relation to the specific job. You know, look at the, the information that's being provided to you and look at the person that's applying for the job or the position that they're in, and then document the following items, facts or circumstances surrounding the offense or the conduct, the number of offenses. So I'll, I'll use another, another example. If, um, if I'm someone who committed a crime when I was, let's say, 22 years old, um, and it was a felony, I was convicted, found guilty, I'm now, I don't know, let's call it 28, right? Um, I've learned my lesson, I haven't done anything through probation, so on and so forth. And I'm up for um, a position, let's call it position or requisition one, two, three. And you have another individual, let's call him John Doe, who's applying for the same position. But John Doe in the last two years has had 20 misdemeanors. How are you evaluating them circumstances? And again, of course, what types of crimes are there in relation to the job? And then evidence of the individual performed the same type of work, uh, length and consistency of the employment before, you know, do they hold a job in the interim where they could successfully hold a job uh, where it wouldn't affect their employment with you as a new organization or as a new employer? Um, character references, so things like references, employment verifications, education checks. Um, and here's the thing. Our legal, Safe Arth and Shaw, they're going to do um, a webinar for us. Pamela Damata is one of the, um, I guess, leading attorneys in employment law. She's going to do a webinar specifically on this one slide going in huge depth. I highly encourage you guys to join us August 13th if you can. Um, but we get it. This is a large change for employers. When you look at adjudication matrices, for example, like I told you earlier, I spent a lot of my time consulting with current and prospective clients. And I get into these, these meetings and I look at adjudication matrices and I get them. I do. I understand where you guys are as an organization and where you're trying to protect yourselves uh, when it comes to negligent hiring. The problem with it, with it now or today is because of these guidelines, I would highly encourage you guys to kind of reevaluate your adjudication matrix. I had a conversation, um, gosh, uh, 30 days ago maybe at the max um, with a a prospect and they still had bright line rules. If you have a felony, I cannot employ you. So I encouraged them to go back to the legal to review these documents. And their, their argument was, you know, we work with children. If it's a felony record, if it's a violent crime, I don't care how far back it is, I cannot employ you. Makes sense, common sense wise. If I'm the employer, I totally understand. The problem is you're seeing a lot of EEOC and FCRA civil action lawsuits against employers because of that. Um, you know, we saw the, one of the largest uh, class action lawsuits in 2012 with Pepsi, which in, in my opinion, I think at that point, the EEOC then published guidelines to say, okay, well, really here's how you are supposed to look at criminal history before determining eligibility of that candidate. Um, and then quickly thereafter, you saw some other larger organizations like BMW, Dollar General, and that, now you're starting to see some of the, I guess, less brand name um, industries getting into these civil action lawsuits, J.B. Hunt Transportation, Swift Transportation. I didn't put their total here. I just read this article um, a couple of weeks ago. You know, they paid $4.4 million um, to one individual for a violation of FCRA and, and EOC um, um, I guess, discrepancies, or um, what's the word I'm looking for? Goodness, I can't even speak today. It's Wednesday. Um, but anyways, you're just seeing a lot of dollars kind of going out there. And the problem is, is yeah, we've been using the same adjudication matrix. We've been using the same policies for many, many years. How often are we reevaluating these? And then, of course, as new guidelines come out, are we reevaluating? Okay. And then let's go on to the next slide here.
Okay, before I get into kind of criminal checks and databases, um, Megan, I'm going to pause. Do you have any questions? Um, how would you ask the question to an applicant about their criminal history so that it is legal and understandable to the applicant? That's a good question. I'm probably not the best person to answer that. Um, what I will say on the guidelines, they recommend that you remove any type of criminal question from the application. So the first time that a candidate provides any data about themselves to you about a job, um, they recommend it come completely off, off of the application. And it's something that you ask right before you do the background check. So um, again, these are just recommendations based on the EEOC guidelines. I would say it's gonna depend on where you are, what your industry is and what your legal says. I hope that answers your question. I'm sorry, I can't give you um, a black and white on that. And then another one just popped up as well. Are there certain guidelines for the healthcare industry? If so, where could the, where could those be found? So the EEOC, regardless, um, is across all industries about how you should look at these. When you're healthcare, obviously your Department of Health, whomever it may be within your state, will have specific guidelines of adjudication of who can be employed based on position. Um, typically, what I will tell you, depending on your state, go to your Department of Health. They will have published guidelines or statutes that will say these type of offenses, these individuals cannot be in um, what I'll call um, patient facing or patient interaction um, positions like CNAs, RNs, uh, physicians, so on and so forth. But maybe your clerks or your billing staff uh, or medical coders may have some of those um, offenses. Again, I, I apologize, I'm not a lawyer. I can't provide you the direct information, but I think your first start would be going to the Department of Health um, within the state that you're in to read those guidelines. Anything else, Megan? Nope, that's it. Okay. All right, so I think I'm right on pace here. Let's get to um, the nature of a database and criminal checks. So, oh, criminal databases. Um, <laughs> these are one of the things that, um, I have like a love-hate relationship with them. And I'll, I'll explain kind of as we go, but first, you know, what are they? they? They do come in many different forms. You can get national criminal databases. You can get state databases. Um, national criminal databases are owned by the private sector. So meaning a company like Global HR Research can own a national criminal database. It's not regulated. It's not accurate. So let me explain. Uh, I'll use Global as an example. We have. Um, a national criminal database with over 250 million records in it. Great. Um, essentially, we are able to obtain records from multiple sources, whether it be the clerk of courts, the office of administrative courts, um, the appellate courts, the sheriff's offices, the state repositories. We can get these records, put them into a data bank, and allow you guys to purchase it, right? There is no such thing as taking someone's name, date of birth, and social, plugging into this magical system and getting every crime they've ever committed. It would be awesome in our industry because it would make things much easier for us to find, uh, but essentially it doesn't exist, okay? Now, what I will say about national criminal databases, it is marketed for I don't put the word in here, but I will tell you, it's marketed at sex appeal. It's telling you it is a super search. It's a national scan. It's a national and local check. It's a, I've heard it called a million different things. Guys, essentially, you know what it is? It's a data bank of a bunch of data across the United States that you guys can purchase. Okay. Now, if we talk about a database, it is what it is. Okay, so databases really are only as good as the information that's collected and, of course, provided to you. There are going to be holes, period. Imagine as Swiss cheese. You're going to get a whole wheel of Swiss cheese, but you know there's stuff missing out of it. That's essentially what a national criminal database is, okay? So I'm going to give you an example of how this works. If John Doe is convicted of a crime, let's say he's found guilty, we know that 100% of the time it's going to be recorded and available at the county level. So if he walks outside, commits a crime, he's going to be arrested by the local police, state police, city police, whoever it is. And if and when he's convicted, those records are held at a central repository at the court level. Sometimes, keyword sometimes, it's held at a state repository. Um, a great example is California doesn't hold a state repository. So if you're getting something that's like a state check, from your vendor in California, please understand basically what that is, is let me back up here. It's a national criminal database segmented 
So where if you take that wheel of Swiss cheese, they basically cut you a, a slice of pie out of that and that's what you're getting, okay? How often are state databases updated, if at all? I mean, um, it's kind of like a proprietary national criminal database. We can do a data dump, get the data, but how often is it updated? I will say most vendors are pretty good. Um, you'll have updates from some sources on a daily basis. You'll have some updated on a weekly basis, monthly, quarterly. I will tell you some of them are just a one-time data dump. Here's my data, that's all you get, okay? And that's the same thing with a national database. Oh, sorry, let me go back to the state repository. I will say state repositories end up being a little bit more comprehensive. And the reason being is they're the state agency within that state, right? Um, there are some states that require, you know, the majority of their counties to submit their information to their repository. Again, how often is it updated is up to the state. Megan, I saw a couple of questions come in, so I'm going to pause real quick. Do I need to, do you want to do the questions now or, or do them later? Yep, we have one, it kind of goes back to what we were talking about prior, is what if the, this person's in the transportation industry and they're hiring a CDL driver, can they ask up front if they have a DWI convictions or otherwise lost any of their driving privileges? So um, if you're DOT regulated, it is a little bit different. You should be conducting um, your, you know, obviously your pre-employment MVR, which will show that information. You can also um, do your DOT employments, which will also that it, ask that information, including the um, drug testing info as well. Again, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to give you the same answer. The recommendations from the EEOC across all industries is that you don't ask that on the application. Now, if you ask that in an interview when you've gotten to the next stage, if you ask that prior to uh, conducting a background check, most often cases you've either already provided them the job or offered the position, um, that's their stance on it. Megan, what we can do if possible um, after this, I'm gonna give you a link to a summary of some of these guidelines. The guidelines itself is like 95 pages. I'll provide Megan you the link if you'll get that out to everyone that's attending today so they can kind of get a summary of uh, the new guidelines by the EEOC. Yep, we'll do guys. That will be with your survey when we send that out after the completion of today's webinar. Ah, perfect. Thank you, Megan. Of course, the survey would be the great place for it. Okay. Um, and I'm sorry, whoever answered that question, I hope I answered it to the best of my abilities. I can always um, talk to you one-on-one -on -one if needed, but again, I'll, I'll ask you to go back to your legal. One quick question, Christine, just came in that kind of relates to this. Is there a state by state of best practices um, or state for what we should history? Regardless, does a criminal history check really become a data board at best of hit or miss? So um, what I, and I'm gonna try to re-clarify that so I can better understand, you know, is there a state by state best practices on how you do criminal history? Essentially, if you're going to talk to anybody in our industry, and when I get to the section of best practices, I'm going to give you a package of what most, um, uh, what I'll call partners in our industry will tell you is the best practice for criminal history. Some states, like I said, when I, when I talk about those state databases or state repositories, some states are really good, like New York is great, Colorado's great, um, North Carolina's great, um, those are the ones I'm more familiar with at this point and coming off the top of my head. Some of them are not so great. I mean, some of them you'll go directly to um, the repository and before you do anything, you're going to agree and say, yes, I understand these terms and uh, conditions. And those terms and conditions are gonna say, the data is not up to date. It only includes like a certain percentage of up-to-date data. Um, it may not include certain crimes that are under a certain level of offenses. So just be very cognizant of that. If you guys are pulling those yourselves, look at look at it. I mean, I know we have, um, we're kind of in a, a one click button society where we, we see these tiny little agreements that pop up on our phone, you know, when we get these apps or whatever, and we just go, oh yeah, yep, yeah, sure, click. Um, it's the same way with state repositories. Before you order one, specifically if you're doing them yourselves, um, look at that language, because it will tell you that you're not getting up to date data. So when it comes to state by state, no, there's not really a, a central source. Your legal is going to be the best one to help you with that. Um, but I will give you a best practice package today across all industries, across all states. Anything else, Megan, before I keep going? 
Uh, yep, sorry, there's one that kind of goes with that question. Um, she, this person only recently learned that you have to do a federal district check in addition to a county and national to get more complete picture. So would that be something you recommend? <clears throat> So there's there's a difference, right? And I actually didn't have this slide in here today. Um, actually, it's a great pausing point. I can talk about that. When you're talking about national criminal databases, counties, state repositories, what you're talking about is state specific crimes. So those could be things like um, DUIs, DWIs, um, robbery, uh, child abuse, um, murder, right? kind of what I'll call the more common offenses that you see. Now, when you're talking about federal checks, some of them do overlap. Um, you're talking about crimes against the United States. So if I, I'm gonna choose Florida because we're in Florida, right? So if I go outside and I murder someone, it's against state law for me to do that. Well, it's also against federal law for me to do that. It's not worth the feds to prosecute me on that, right? However, I'll use a great example. Um, the, I can never say his name, but the young kid um, who did the Boston bomber, marathon bomber, I don't think he's been convicted yet. I know he's being prosecuted, but there was a huge time frame. I think there was like a two or three day window. I don't know if you guys saw the media where they, you know, they were pushing for who's going to prosecute him. Is it going to be the state of Massachusetts or is it going to be the federal government? Well, it's a federal charge at this point. He's being um, charged as a, I think, terrorist. So it's a um, act against the US government. Or um, So if we look at this, let's pretend that guy for some reason gets out of jail and applies at your position. If you're running just a national criminal database, state repositories or counties, you will never find that crime. So I'll repeat that. A federal offense is very different than a state offense. That guy, if he were to get out of, of prison of some sort and apply for a position with you, <clears throat> and you run national crime, state repositories, or counties, you'll never find it. If you run a federal check, then you will. Another great example would be Martha Stewart. All of her crimes were federal offenses. So if you're running, <clears throat> I'm so sorry, my voice is going out here, national criminal databases, counties or states, again, Martha Stewart would come up with a clean record. And of course, if you did the federal check, um, those charges would come up. Okay, Megan, any more? I'm probably opening a can of worms here. <laughs> There's two more questions. Um, one is quite is a quick one. Is a request from the national database more expensive than a local database? So when we're talking about databases, um, national databases tend to be inexpensive, kind of like on this slide. Um, the reason being it's, it's owned typically by your background screening vendor. So it's just data that is be, being sent back to you. It can be it depends on how many local checks that you're doing. So when you're saying local, my assumption is county criminal checks. If you're doing just a national criminal database, yeah, it's typically going to be inexpensive, quick turnaround time. Um, if you're doing local checks, they can take a little bit longer. And depending on how many you're doing, again, I would recommend, and we'll get to this, um, you're going to do the last seven years of of, of criminal or county criminal checks, it can be a little bit more expensive. It does obviously depend on what you're doing. I wish I could give you a black and white answer on that. Anything else, Megan? Yep, one last question and we can probably head on to the next slide. If the applicant did not include that they had a felony out of state and it never showed up on the results, what would you recommend doing at that point? Okay, I'm sorry. So if an applicant did not include they had a felony out of state, Mm -hmm. and it didn't show up on any of the results, but you found out after the fact, what would you recommend? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, <laughs> I wish I was a lawyer on the, to, to, so I could answer some of these questions. Um, it depends. It also depends on the type of release that you have them sign. So during a pre-employment phase, um, I think it's called a Greenlee or a Greenlee release, or I think it's what it's called, a Greenlee release. Um, oftentimes it will say, you know, during pre-employment, uh, a Comprehensive background check may be conducted by, insert your background screening firm. There's a next phrase that on your release form should have it that says, and while during employment, right? So essentially your release or your applicant release form will say, hey, we're going to do a background check prior to employment and may, we may also do one during employment, right? It depends on if you have that type of release because essentially, and it's kind of unfortunately what has happened to other businesses when it comes to um, some FCRA violations. They ran a pre-employment background check, 
they heard rumors that that person had, you know, had to go to court for something else. They ran another background check and then terminated them. Problem is the release form said, I'm authorizing you to run one background check prior to employment. I didn't authorize you to run one during employment. So I really do hope that answers your question. I can't tell you what to do if you find data afterwards. Um, you first, I think step one is to look at your releases and then you go off of your, your, pol your internal policies, your company policies on, you know, what's eligible, what's not eligible. Anything else, Megan? Nope, we're ready to go. Okay, and guys, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make sure I get through these slides and then I will make sure I stay on the line to answer any of your specific questions as well. So I kind of talked about this slide already with that question. Um, national databases, again, what's the benefit of it? So I know I keep talking about, okay, databases aren't this and databases aren't that, but there is a benefit. They're inexpensive, it is quick turnaround. It's a great safety net. So if you think about it, if I'm only running local checks or I'll call them county criminal checks in the areas this person's lived, but they went on vacation and they got a DUI or had public intoxication somewhere, Apparently, I seem to think that everyone on vacation drinks, but uh, let's pretend that they did. It's a great safety net to hopefully catch some of those crimes. And of course, it's hundreds of thousands of criminal cases, you know, all in one place. Now, I talked about those state repositories being kind of the same way, right? Again, benefit is a safety net. And if you look at some, some of the areas are very weird. Um, I can't tell you specifically what states, but some counties do submit their information directly to their state agency. So it might be um, the state police department, it might be the state criminal records division, but they don't sell it or provide it to a private sector for national criminal databases. It's, it's very odd, it happens very rarely, but in some cases it does happen. Um, so again, it's not the majority of the time, um, but sometimes if they do sell it, they only sell it as a one-time data dump, all right? So I just want to go back to what I talked about earlier. I said all this stuff about databases, all this stuff about state repositories. And then I also mentioned to you guys section 607 and 613 of the federal guidelines for the FCRA. So things that regulate background screening vendors like us. They say it must be reasonable, accurate, strict, and up-to-date. So according to dictionary.com, those of you that know me, I'm a huge Wikipedia and dictionary.com person. Reasonable just means that it's logical. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, accuracy means being true, correct, and exact. Maintaining strict um, guidelines have to be enforced and maintained. So again, I, I told you databases aren't enforced or regulated. And then they have to be up to date, so they have to be current. Here's the deal, guys. A, an arrest record is not up to date, right? If I got arrested in, I don't know, let's call it 2000 and, 13, and you get that record back. Oh, well, let's not even use 2013, let's use 2010, okay? It's within seven years, you get it back on your report. It's just an arrest. Is that up to date? No. Most oftentimes I'm being charged. The up-to-dateness is, um, is it pending? Am I convicted? Am I deferred adjudication? Is it adjudication withheld? Was it dismissed? I mean, there's all these different adjudications or um, dispositions that will occur on these cases. So my question to you guys is, based on this information, is a database check accurate and up-to-date? Should be pretty simple. Answer is no, okay? So my next question is, then how can your CRA or your background screening firm maintain strict and reasonable procedures to ensure that what they're giving to you is accurate and up to date if they're providing you database information? Guys, as, a, as the Director of Strategic Relations, I spent a lot of time helping respond to um, requests for proposals. And one of the biggest questions that I think everyone fails in asking is this, right? If I'm asking you to give me any type of criminal history and any type of background check, how are you maintaining based on your federal law, that's again, when I say you, the background screening firm, how are you maintaining strict and reasonable procedures to ensure accuracy and up-to-dateness when you're providing me these records? Because you guys as the employer, now you've got to trust the data you're getting back to make the right decision. I hope that really makes sense to you guys and why I talked about all this little like legality stuff. I know it's boring, um, but 
there are reasons. Section 607 and 613 are huge right now. Unfortunately, there have been a lot of providers in our industry that have kind of skirted those issues for many years. They've been slapped on the wrist. Now they're being brought into light with these civil action lawsuits. Um, and you're seeing a change in the industry. People are starting to go, oh, I have to figure out how to do this now, right? What do I do now? Because it's not black and white. So I would highly suggest that you guys understand how your background screening firm is number one, staying compliant, and number two, helping you stay compliant, that little gray area. So how do you do that? You get things at the source. Like we said earlier, that John Doe example, for the most part, I know that that data is going to be up to date and accurate at the county level, right? So if we look at this on a high level, where, where can you get data? You can get federal data from a national federal criminal check, okay? If you go to the source, the great news about a national federal check, uh, federal criminal check, it is the source, which is great because there's less districts out there than there are counties. So this is a great source for you. If you guys are running districts, let me help save you some money here. Go back and stop doing districts. Go back and ask for a national federal, okay? You're gonna spend a lot more money with your vendor doing individual districts like you do for counties when you can get everything at the national federal criminal check level. Um, you can, if you prefer, if your policies say you'll go straight to the district, you can do so. It's essentially the exact same thing. You just end up spending, spending a little bit more money. Um, state crimes, you can get them at a national criminal, on a high level, a national criminal database. You can get them from a state law enforcement network or a state repository, but at the source is counties. So your biggest thing, and I'm going to grab a, a pin here, if you are getting any of these things, right, a part of your package is a part of your, your background check um, policy, your question should be, hey, background screening firm or my partner, are you going to the source to confirm the most accurate and up-to-date data before you're sending it to me? All right, Megan, I think this is the end of my section before I move on. Is there any additional questions? Yep, we have two. Um, how would you work with an out of count out of country applicants with green cards or I ten? So those are a little bit different. Um, when you're talking international, obviously there are different international laws. Essentially, if you're operating in the United States, your core business is here, and your policies have certain guidelines of how you're doing criminal history, you can still conduct those checks. Um, most of your background screening vendors that are out there can run international screening. I will be upfront with you. Some countries, I mean, not some, not all countries are like the United States, right? We have um, kind of streamlined laws, rules, regulations, even though they're across different states. Maybe the punishment from state to state is a little bit different, but most oftentimes what's illegal in one state is typically illegal in another. When you get to other countries, it may change from region to region. Um, so it makes it very difficult to obtain comprehensive criminal checks. Um, some countries make you file a police report. Let me give you a great example, guys. Um, this may or may not get me in trouble, but I am not a fan of um, criminal background checks in countries like uh, Mexico is a great example. Mexico requires that you do a police report. Well, here's the problem. There are some countries, as you guys know, are a little more corrupt um, with the way that they, they report their data. So there's not a lot of legitimacy and we can't confirm that the data we're getting back. And, and when I say we, I mean all vendors in our industry. We can't say, hey, this is 100% accurate because it's the only source we can get it from. And some sources can be a little corrupt. If you pay, you know, the police department, you know, I don't know, 100 US dollars, would they wipe your records clean before they provide it back to the vendor? Maybe. Um, in some countries, it's better. I mean, they do have repositories where they keep this information, like the U.S. So it just completely depends. I, I'm sorry, just international just is one of those weird things that it changes from country to country. All right. Anything else, Megan? Yep. Um, what would you do if applicants said the background information is incorrect? That's a great question. So that's called a dispute. If a candidate says, hey, the background check information is incorrect, you are, oh, well, not you. I'm sorry, the background screening firm, so the CRA, is required by federal law to do a reinvestigation of that check. So if you're the employer and John Doe says, hey, this information is wrong, you need to point them back to the background sc screening firm and say, 
please call them or email them or visit their website or whatever it is and dispute the information. Again, it is a federal requirement from the background screening firm that we do the reinvestigation within 30 days. It should not take that long, let me tell you that. But we have up until 30 days to complete the reinvestigation to either provide back to you guys and the consumer, so the employee or, or candidate, hey, the original background was complete, up to date and accurate on the date it was ordered, here's a copy of it. Or, hey, we reported something erroneously, here's the updated version, okay? Here's the deal, and I wanna get very specific on this. Oftentimes you'll see um, some will have a pending case or they will have um, like a, a ticket or they have to pay a fine. Sometimes things will be dismissed after they pay their court fines, fees, probation, whatever it is. So when you run the background check, they think, oh yeah, it's good. I got rid of everything. It should be dismissed. It should be fine. And it shows up because they haven't completed making all their payments. They'll come back to you, you know, a week later and say, hey, this information is incorrect because they've gone back to the court and said, oh my gosh, I forgot to pay this 50 bucks. Let me give you a check. <clears throat> that is not an erroneous record to you guys. We reported it the day um, they ordered it, you know, how the record stood at that point. So it is kind of one of those weird areas, but if they do contest the information, you, you need to send them back to the background screening firm. It is our requirement by federal law to do so. Megan, anything else? We're okay to move on. All righty. So just talking about the best practice package, <clears throat> guys, this is across the board in any background screening firm um, across the industry. You can do a lot of different, um, I guess, variations of this. You can add items to it. You can remove items from it. Um, from our standpoint, you wanna have something that's called a social security trace and address history. You wanna include the national criminal database the National Sex Offender and Violent Abuse Registry, the OFAC, which is the terrorist watch list. Um, you wanna do all the county criminal searches as populated by the address history and a national federal criminal check. My next slide will explain why. So don't freak out if I, I flip screens here. Let me explain to you why these are suggested. Um, a social security trace and address history, what this essentially does, I think this is one of those things where everyone gets a little confused. You see social security, I've seen this as social security verification and address population. Guys, this doesn't verify someone's social at all, okay? All it does is pre-populates locations and names based on credit headers and proprietary databases, right? Why do you use this? It's an investigative tool. If I committed murder in Texas, I'm not gonna say to you as my potential employer, by the way, I committed murder in Texas. Let me give you that address, right? I think all of us probably have in our applications, list me, you know, all of your previous names and this last seven years of your addresses. If I committed a crime there, guys, now let's be hopeful that everyone's gonna be honest. I'll probably give you that address. But in most cases, if I know it's gonna withhold my ability to, to get that job, I may just not give you the address. So this is a great inexpensive little tool that you add to every package that you do to help point to where you, need, you wanna do criminal history. Now, <clears throat> I call this the trifecta of databases. It's the National Criminal Database, the Sex Offender Registry, and the OFAC. Um, every company and industry is gonna call it something different. It's just, again, it's a nice safety net. It's quick, inexpensive. Um, a compliant and reliable CRA will verify and adjudicate all possible records at the source level. So if something comes up here, they will go to the source to confirm that it is up to date and accurate in accordance to obviously section 607 and 613. So that's a great little, again, tool, investigative or criminal tool that you add to your packages. I've talked about county criminals before. Note it says populated by the address history. It's up-to-date and accurate criminal records, populated by the Social Security Trace. It can also be populated by previous and current employers, education. It's one of those things where it's, um, I'm sure you've heard of it as lived, worked, or went to school. Most of your providers can even provide cutoff ranges, like, okay, well, I only want it to populate, you know, lived, worked, went to school for the past seven years. That's available. You can do that as well, right? And then a national federal criminal check. Someone brought that up earlier, you know, well, I just found out that I have to do a federal check because not all crimes are gonna be there. Yes, it's two separate different types of crimes, 
But again, if we're talking about best practice, due diligent background screening, um, you want to do a national federal criminal check. Um, it's up to date. It's accurate federal criminal records. And again, think Mark, Martha Stewart, uh, the Boston Marathon bomber. Okay. All right. I was right on time, so I'm so excited. Um, Megan, I know we probably have a lot of questions. Guys, I'm going to stay on the line for the next 10 to 15 minutes asking specific questions. But I do want to thank you guys for joining us this afternoon. I appreciate your time. Um, Megan, I believe this will be recorded and posted on the website? Correct. In 48 to 72 hours, it should be up on the website. Great. And I really do um, hope that you guys do respond to the to the survey. It lets us know how good of a job we're doing, any additional topics you would like to hear from Global HR Research as we continue our webinar series. So Megan, I'm going to turn it over to you to ask me the questions. Yep, I have one here. Some background checks come back really quick, same day or two days, and some take longer, a week and a half to two weeks. What affects the turnaround time? It totally depends on um, the location and the type. If you're doing, let's say, the best practice criminal package, let's say that you're doing a national criminal database, sex offender, OFAC, counties, and federal. Um, when you have common names, it tends to take a little bit longer just because someone has to adjudicate those records to ensure it's not your candidate before it's sending out to you, right? Um, certain areas of the U.S. tend to be a little bit slower. I'm, I'm sure you've heard of something called clerk-assisted courts. What that means is when our researchers go in and they ask for a criminal record for John Smith, they literally have to put their name on a list, wait for the clerk to say, okay, hey, Christine, I'm ready for, for you. What do you need? Okay, you need John Smith. Let me go pull him and then I'll give him to you. Um, you'll see that more in kind of the New England states. Um, Southern California tends to be like that. Uh, certain larger metropolitan cities are like that as well, while others are are pretty quick. I mean, they have um, all their data electronically, and they allow for businesses or consumer reporting agencies like Global HR to basically integrate directly to their system. So the moment that you order the request or order it in the system, um, we can ping their records, get, get the information back electronically, so up-to-date records, um, and then all it really takes is an adjudication or a quality assurance uh, process from the vendor. Hope I answered oh. your question. Go ahead, Megan. Yep, I was going to say um, the next one is, what do you do if a background check comes back with a crime that is undesignated? Mm you shouldn't have a crime that was undesignated. So I'm a little confused on that question. Read it to me one more time, Megan. It simply says that. What do you do if a background check comes back with a crime that is undesignated? So that I would a question. Yeah, yeah, I would send that back to your background screening firm and say, what is this? Uh, I, I don't know um, specific without seeing it myself, but I would send it back to your firm because you should be getting full complete records. Anything else, Megan? Yep. Let me go to the next question. What goes into the name or alias search? Um, hold on. Let me pull up the questions thing so I can kind of understand. So what goes into the name and alias search? Uh, this depends on your vendor. Um, when you're doing the Social Security trace and address history, it should pre-populate addresses and alias names. If you do alias name checks, um, props to you, because most criminal history is done on first name, last name, and date of birth. Meaning, if we're pulling records, it truly is, I need to check for John Smith with this date of birth, right? If it's something like, let's call it Robert Smith, and he goes by Rob, most oftentimes it is a exact match. So you want to do that social security trace and address history to pre-populate those aliases so you can look at criminal history from all different angles. Um, when you're asking what's included with an alias check, it completely depends on your vendor. All right, Megan, anything else? Yep. yep. Let's go to the next one. Some of this um, person's clients run the social SSN verification, and that always takes a bit longer. Do you recommend running that report or just run the social security trace? Ah, gotcha. So there are um, different ways to verify social. Um, like I said earlier, the social security trace and address history is not a verification of social. Um, all it is is an investigative tool to help populate locations. If you were to ask me, if you were my client, we were having this conversation, I would tell you, 
you need to put that that search on every single package or any time that you run a criminal background check every single time a social security administration verification that is truly verifying someone's social so that's done for a completely different purpose all right next when someone's social security history shows mary c smith mc smith m smith mary smith etc do you have to run them all separately or will the same social security number catch all the information so that kind of goes back to my last um comment Criminal history is done by first name, last name, and date of birth. Now, what I will tell you, running initials don't help, but if it truly is different spellings, different names, um, again, if you were my client and I was talking to you, I would say run all aliases. Um, I have had horror stories, even with Global HR Research, where we've had clients call and say, hey, I ran a background check on John Smith, and you guys didn't send us back any of these crimes, right? I'm going, okay, great those crimes were run under uh, Michael Smith. He goes by his middle name or whatever it is. Um, and of course, those crimes didn't come back. You can't plug in someone's social and get all the crimes they've ever committed. It's never done by social. If you think about uh, privacy purposes, most courts don't record your social and or provide your social out um, if you were to commit a crime. Anything else? These two questions, yep, these two questions kind of go together. What is an adjudication matrix and can you act on adjudication and treat it like a true conviction? Okay, so an adjudication matrix is your internal policies and processes when you're evaluating eligibility um, of a candidate. So you get back a background check and you're going, okay, based on our policies, can I employ this person or can I not employ this person? The second question you said, can you act on an adjudication and, and I'm sorry, what? And treat it like a true conviction. Okay, so my assumption is what you're you're trying to say maybe is if there's um, adjudication deferred or deferred adjudication or adjudication withheld, can you act on them? It's a little bit, it, it depends. Um, yes and no. Uh, most states will say if you have, if you receive those records within seven years, um, you can look at them like convictions. However, again, my answer to almost everyone is going to be, what do your policies say? If your policies, so your adjudication matrix, your internal adjudication, and your policies say, if you have, let's pretend it's a uh, sexual crime, and you were found guilty, convicted, deferred adjudication, adjudication withheld, you may or may not be eligible, then yeah, you can use it against them. If you're not specifying it, again, I would go back to your legal and start to define some of those items. Okay, last question I have up right now is, is there any point in running a social security number validation if you're running a social security number verification? So um, let me actually go back to my slide so I can make sure we're, we're talking apples to apples here. A social security trace and address history, address history is not a verification of social whatsoever. It is just taking that person's social, running it against some type of credit headers or proprietary databases, and pulling addresses and names. There is only one way, or I'm sorry, two ways of doing um, verification of social. One is a Social Security Administration verification, meaning going right to the Social Security Administration to say, hey, is this social real? Did you issue it? Is it still active? Two is via E-Verify. Anything else, Megan? Nope, that was our last question. All right. Well, guys, I appreciate everyone joining us today. Um, Megan, is there anything else we need to announce before we let everybody go? Nope, I think we're good. Guys, just be on the lookout for your survey and the links to the summaries that Christine talked about for the next, the next hour or two. All right. Thanks, guys. You'll have a great day.